Hey everyone and welcome to a new video on visual computer science. The place where you learn new things about software engineering, computer science, programming, pretty much anything in that space. In this video, you're going to learn the technologies that you need to know to become a backend software engineer in 2021. And the technologies that you can see here are just a very small part of them. So let's jump into it. All right, so first of all, let's understand what actually means backend, right? Well, let's imagine that we have a website or a mobile application. The clients are using it because they are actually doing something useful with the data that the input provides, but also with the data that the website provides for the users. Whether we are talking about a social network or a news website or anything like that. Well, in order for those websites or applications to do something really useful with the data, they need to talk to a server, to an application server, which is usually deployed in the cloud or on a specific server somewhere on the internet usually. The role of this application server is to manipulate the data that the user inputs into the website or into the application and to do something meaningful with it, either store it or transferring it to an external website or application or anything that the, the logic of that website may have to do with it. Now, this part of the system, which consists of the actual website or the, the mobile application is called the front end. And it's actually the first entry point of the user into the system because the, the user actually interacts with this, this part of the system. And everything that's in the right side of the screen is the actual backend. So the application server, the actual infrastructure behind it, the databases and anything that may be here, right? Elasticsearch servers, Hadoop servers, anything like that. So in this video, we're going to talk about backend technologies, but we're going to focus more on the application servers and pretty much any technologies that is around it. In a future video, we're going to talk about databases as well. Now, in order to present those technologies, I split them into multiple categories. So the first category is the programming languages. Which programming languages are used to develop backend systems? First of all, we got JavaScript, which is probably the most widely used programming language in the world, specifically because you can write front-end but also back-end code with it. But there are also other ones, for example, Ruby on Rails, another very popular programming language. We also got Java, a very popular language for the enterprises and a lot of companies are using it, specifically because it's really easy to learn and uh, build code in Java, but also because of the performance considerations that this has. We can also write backend code in Python, a very simple and easy to learn language specifically designed to make things really easy and straightforward. But we also have other languages as well. We got C Sharp, which is widely used in the Microsoft or .NET ecosystem. We also got Kotlin, which is an emerging language that uh, was developed uh, specifically for the um, Android development first. But now it also goes into the server-side development and it has a big success here because it takes the Java ecosystem and adds some really nice feature on top of it. And once we have Scala and Golang, really nice languages uh, with uh, big communities behind them. Now, keep in mind that those are not the only programming languages that we can use for backend development. Those are the most important ones, actually. So what should you actually know about those languages, right? Well, first of all, you should know the actual syntax, which is, of course, specific to each language. You also need to know some design patterns, some best practices that are usually important for that language and ecosystem where, where the language actually relies. Design patterns allow your code to be scalable and well-structured so that you don't end up with spaghetti code or code that you cannot maintain at some point. Also really important is the multi-threading part because usually the backend applications are run on servers which have multiple cores. So it's really important for the application to be able to leverage that processing capability by the use of multi-threading. So you should know how to synchronize threads, how can you split the problems so that you can bring parallelism into it and also how to avoid race conditions. And very important tips and tricks about that language and things that you should avoid. This goes hand in hand with the actual best practices that you should know for the language. And of course, you're going to learn those by experience, right? So don't have to worry about this. Now, the next category is the actual frameworks. Because if you know a language really well, you can do really much with the actual standard library that comes with that language. So you should also know some frameworks, which is basically some code that allows you to bring some functionality into your applications. For example, Spring Boot is a really important and widely used framework that allows you to build REST APIs, microservices, and pretty much any commonly used backend service. It has a really nice annotation system and also configuration system really well done. This makes it a really valuable framework to use, which is also used by a lot of companies. Spring Boot is usually a framework for developed for Java and Kotlin, but there are also other ones. For example, for Python, we got Django, Again, a framework that can be used for uh, web development. Also Ruby on Rails, ASP.NET for C Sharp, 
a really important um, framework used in the .NET ecosystem a lot. And also we got Node.js and specifically with the actual Express.js framework, we can build backends in JavaScript. Now, what should you actually learn or know about a framework? It's really important to know the documentation or at least to, to read it a few times to understand the strong and the weak points of the actual framework. This is usually useful to read before adopting that framework into your system. You should also know some basic usage for that framework. How can you import it in your project and um, create a minimal configuration for it so that you can use the main functionality that it provides. And of course, over time, this will go to an advanced usage, right? It's really important to also have some performance considerations as well, because if you're building some high scale system or a very low latency system, it's really important to know if that framework actually will bring some performance improvements or even worse to affect the performance in a negative way, because you cannot really change the code in a framework, specifically if that framework is not open source. But even if it is, you need to collaborate with the community to see uh, if that fix will actually be beneficial for the framework. So it's really important to know the, the performance implications upfront. And finally, it's really important to know some known issues issues around that framework, usually because as I previously mentioned, you cannot change them so fast. So you should be aware of them to make sure you're not hitting those issues along the way. The next category is the actual tools that a backend software engineer should have. And by tools, I'm referring here to IDEs. For example, IntelliJ IDEA is a really great IDE that you can use to build code in Java, Scala, Kotlin, even JavaScript. It is extremely powerful. It has a lot of um, functionalities, can be pluggable. It's one of the best IDs in the industry at this moment. For Python, there's also PyCharm, which is a really popular IDE. And usually you should search for the most popular IDE for the programming language that you're actually using, because usually those have the best community, the best ecosystem that you can use to maximize your productivity. Also, any backend software engineer needs to have some terminal setup, because usually the classical terminal for pretty much any operating system does not offer so many capabilities. There are some terminal add-ons, for example, iTerm, is a really important one which gives you some nice themes, some nice uh, shortcuts. Those are actually a productivity boost specifically if you are uh, using it a lot. I cannot mention enough that having a source control system is probably one of the most important tools in pretty much any software engineer, not necessarily on the backend, because in this way you can have your code versioned, you can uh, go back in history to fix uh, bugs. It has a large number of advantages. We're going to make a dedicated video for Git as well. A build system is really important. As an example, Maven and Gradle are really important build systems for JVM based languages. What they actually do is to take your code and build it in order to generate an artifact, which is actually a file that contains your code, whether we're talking about a jar or an RPM or any other packaged version of, a, of an executable file technically. And they are really important because you can configure them in different ways to, to grab dependencies from different um, sources, to manage dependency conflicts and uh, a lot of other functionalities. And of course, Docker, the most widely used container runtime in, this, in the industry right now. It's really important used in the build systems, in the deployment system as well, highly scalable. Definitely you should check it out. And also Visual VM is a profile used to kind of see what happens behind a JVM. This is specific to JVMs, but I'm pretty sure that any language has its own tool set of uh, profiling and uh, seeing what's behind the actual application once it's running. So what should you know about those tools? You should know a lot of shortcuts, specifically in IDEs. It's actually a productivity boost if you know how to do things without using the mouse and only using the keyboard. With time, you're going to get pro efficiency in these tools, but it's really important to use them consistently. Also, the documentation is really important, specifically for, for Git and for build systems like uh, Gradle. A lot of things are happening behind the scenes. So in order to have a clear understanding on what those systems are doing, it's important to understand and to read the documentation whenever you get the chance. And finally, tips and tricks on all those things can be learned with experience as well. I'm placing this as a separate bullet because this is what a more senior backend developer has in their toolset. Right? It knows how to avoid different things to save time and to do things faster. Now moving on to the next category, which is related to CI CD. So first of all, what means CI CD? CI CD stands for Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment. And it's actually a, a set of technologies that allows us to build 
pipelines like this. What this does is to take your code, once you merged it into a, the source control system, like in Git, for example, you're merging the code and then the CICD tools that we're going to talk about in a second are starting to do their job, which is to take your code to build it, to run some tests, to make sure that everything goes well with your new code, right? And finally, to deploy that code into the production or into testing environments and so on, right? Releasing the code into the wild. That's what CICD tools are actually doing. And we got a number of examples of tools that are doing this. For example, Jenkins, Travis CI, Spinnaker, TeamCity, and many others. Some of them are open source, for example, Spinnaker, and some of them are uh, paid, for example, Team City. It's really important to understand what those tools are doing, how to configure them, how to actually create a pipeline design because a CI/CD workflow, it is composed of a pipeline that contains multiple steps. So usually as a developer, you're going to develop that pipeline, but also to adjust it when needed. So it's extremely important to understand the logical steps that need to be involved. Those tools can also be integrated with other systems. For example, if the build succeeds, you may want to receive an email or a message on your phone. And you can do this by integrating that tool, for example, Jenkins with an email publisher or with, with Slack or with uh, Skype or with any other uh, messaging application that you currently use. So those types of integrations are really useful because they allow you to be connected with the state of your of your code. And finally, you may have to do some optimization sometimes to minimize the build time to ensure the, the flawless of this workflow. So having the chance to optimize or to learn how to optimize the workflows is really, really beneficial. So the next category of technologies is related to the infrastructure, which actually relates to the cloud technologies. And yes, I'm talking about the major public cloud providers, for example, AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. Those are companies which are providing cloud services for you as a developer or for you as a company, right? Each one of them has a web platform that you can use to buy different services which are mapped to the needs for your application. Now, if you're doing this at scale, you may end up into some issues related to the way you manage those resources. So for that reason, you may have to think about other ways of managing the cloud resources. And here, Terraform comes into the picture. Terraform is a technology that allows us to manage cloud resources by using the code. So instead of um, having you to go in, into that web platform and click around to create uh, 100 servers, which may be different, you can use Terraform to build some code that will automate this operation for you. So this is also known as infrastructure as a code. And that's something mandatory for any company that is using public cloud at scale. And probably one of the most important technologies in this infrastructure space is Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a container orchestration platform, which allows you to deploy microservices in a very easy and scalable way. You should definitely check it out. Probably one of the most widely used uh, technologies on the infrastructure level for deploying new applications these days and around kubernetes have been developed a large number of projects which have different roles and different purposes of course helm is one of them technically a package manager for kubernetes it allows you to create uh, resources and to manage them in a really uh, easy and um, scalable way now around this infrastructure what are the main things that you should know as a backend developer well first of all you should know how to use the compute services like how can you provision some servers which are by the way virtual machines deployed in the cloud, right? That's the way they are actually created in data centers. Also, it's really important to know how to how to use message passing services. For example, um, SQS from AWS, PubSub from Azure. Those are services that allows you to send data from one source to a destination or from one application to another, regardless of the location of that application. They can be in different parts of the world. And by using message passing services, you are able to exchange data between those in a very easy way, right? You also want to know about load balancing, how to create a load balancer, how to direct traffic into it and how to link some servers to it so that you can balance the traffic between them. It's actually a very simple to use service because the UI allows you to do pretty much all the things. And also in general, the cloud documentation is really well done. Don't worry, you're going to learn about all those things really, really fast. You should also know how to store data into the cloud by using um, storage services like Amazon S3, any day database, for example, Cosmos DB in Azure, it's kind of a mandatory thing to know because usually any application works with data. So you need to know how to store data into the cloud and grab it from there, how to efficiently store data so that you can minimize costs 
So a lot of things around this can be learned. And the last item that I'm going to mention here is serverless processing or Lambda or function-like processing, meaning like you're not um, provisioning a server on the cloud, but rather invoking a service which creates a one-time processing for that invocation, which uses some, some data or does any custom logic that you want. It is a trend right now with uh, serverless processing specifically because you're not using a server all day long. So you're not using the, the compute layer, basically. You're only invoking some processing when you actually need it. And finally, the last category that we're going to talk about in this video is the monitoring or the observability one. In other words, we have our application deployed in the cloud, but how can we know that it works well? How can you know if it has a problem, right? Like it consumes too much memory or something bad happens with it, right? So we need to monitor the application in some way. So for that reason, there have been developed some uh, dedicated systems for that. For example, Prometheus is a metric storage system, which grabs metrics from, from your application by periodically calling your application on a specific endpoint. Of course, the application should expose metrics, internal metrics on that endpoint. And Prometheus stores them into a time series database. It has a very efficient way of storing that data. There are also other systems like this. For example, Graphite and InfluxDB are just uh, two very popular systems which are similar to, but that's actually not enough because once you have the metrics stored, you need to see them in some sort of a dashboard or a graph. And for that, Grafana comes into the picture, another component that knows to read the metrics from uh, Prometheus and Graphite and is able to create dashboards like this one, where you can actually see what's happening with your application. So what should you know about the monitoring stack? Well, you should know some general knowledge, how it actually works, how it stores the metrics, how can you expose metrics from your application so that it integrates well with um, Prometheus or with any other metric system that you have. The way you can query those metrics in an efficient way so that you are not exhausting the servers which are running Prometheus, for example, the way the, the monitoring stack is deployed, and finally, the way you design the dashboard so that it's meaningful and exposes the actual metrics that you need. All right, everyone, so that was all from my side. I really hope you find this video useful. Make sure to hit that subscribe and like button, and I'll see you in the next video.